Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on deploying UAS solutions for wildfires. Thank you for taking some time to join us today. I'm really excited to be joined by Chief Baker and Dave Harris from New Zealand. So a variety of time zones. I know some of you will be watching this as a recording after as well, but thank you for taking some time out of your day to join us. The recording will be sent of the webinar a few, af or a few hours after uh, the conclusion. And then we'll also share some additional resources from our team later on in the week. Throughout the webinar, you can add questions for us to address at the end of the webinar in the right tab here within GoToWebinar. And that pretty much wraps things up on the admin side. Would also like to give a quick thank you to the first responders who contributed information and took time to sit down for interviews so we could make sure to bring applicable and accurate information to you all. Dave and Wayne also have a variety of in the field experience, so we're excited to hear from them as well. My name's Grant Hostka. I lead our solutions engineering team here in North America. I work a lot with public safety agencies, making sure to bring information from them back to our R&D team while trying to communicate key information on how to deploy our drones successfully in a variety of use cases. We'll pass it over to Chief for an intro on himself. Thank you, Grant, uh, and thank you, David, for being here with us today. Um, I'm Wayne Baker, Director of Public Safety Integration at DJI, uh, retired fire chief uh, and actually still active pilot with a uh, regional drone team in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So that's where I'll be able to give some of my experience today. But um, thank you guys for all joining us and David. Thanks, Grant. Thanks, Wayne. And thanks uh, to the opportunity to, to speak today. Um, yeah, David Harris, uh, General Manager and Director of Interfine Innovation here in New Zealand, uh, forestry consulting and management company uh, here in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, my firefighting uh, background experience is uh, Deputy Station Officer uh, volunteer over the last uh, 12 years and also a range of wildfire experience uh, being in the forest industry uh, for my career. Also a member of uh, our national incident management teams for the purposes of wildfire deployment, uh, particularly in the intelligence uh, unit leader role. And I guess that brings my breadth of experience from forestry in the context of remote sensing, uh, of which drones is, is one of those components. So look forward to sharing that with you today. Thanks, Dave and Wayne. Give you a quick rundown of what we'll hit today and then get into the content. So both Dave and Chief Baker will kind of run through some of their previous wildfire deployments, some of the techniques and situations that were encountered. We'll then give a summary of some of the UAS capabilities and workflow tips for some of the different items uh, that Dave and Wayne talk about show a few new solutions and applications that we've seen, and then cover your questions at the end. So we'll go ahead and pass it over to David. Thanks, Graham. So yeah, great to have the opportunity to uh, give you some insight into how we've been using, uh, particularly DJI drones, uh, thermal cameras, and for the use in wildfires uh, over the last six years. Give a little bit of context uh, with myself. Um, like I mentioned, uh, both have that role in commercial forestry, remote sensing, uh, but also very much um, uh, firefighting throughout uh, my forestry career as well. And particularly um, as a deputy station officer uh, for the last 12 years, um, I've had the opportunity to also uh, travel and be deployed into overseas deployment. A uh, little bit of context there on the bottom left-hand corner of the New Zealand flag there and that's uh, helping the up in British Columbia in 2018 fire season. So I'm gonna mention a little bit about uh, what we did over there. Also, uh, just a, a context from Interpine's perspective, um, a number of our staff actually deploy internationally uh, over the years and uh, both uh, into uh, North America, but also into our uh, friendly neighbor in Australia as well. 
So just to add a little bit of context of where we've come from, um, this video here is actually from 2017 and deployment of the, the DJI drones uh, for the purposes of, of wildfire. Confirming Grant, you can hear that okay? So hopefully that gives you a bit of a, a context of um, the use of drones and the, the deployment uh, for wildfires. And it really started at this point. Um, again, this is actually an image from 2016. Incident controller, uh, wondering what these drones are. We've got helicopters in sight lighting up a control burn here. And, uh, and of course, also for uh, patrolling and uh, dropping water buckets on the fire. So really, it's, it's a context where do these drones fit in? Um, really, once the uh, incident controller was able to see this imagery uh, coming from the drone, and, and again, this is where the drone is actually sitting on the ground, uh, simply because we've got manned aircraft in the air at the time, and we can see that fire tornado actually coming in towards uh, our fire perimeter in that sector. And so really that gave um, great confidence for that incident controller to, to say actually these drones are going to be useful, and, uh, and let's get that in the air. So coordinating with uh, manned aircraft, uh, we uh, got the drone up into the air. And what we can see is uh, that typically in these situations in wildfire, it's, it's mostly a lot of smoke. Um, but with those thermal cameras uh, fitted into the uh, UATS, we can see how we can actually see through that smoke uh, patrol perimeters and keep an eye on, in this case here, a control burn uh, training operation that we usually have. Uh, prior to our wildfire season. Uh, we have a number of these and, uh, and upskills and tests uh, all our systems and equipment, et cetera. So really great to, um, to be able to uh, pilot that with uh, the DJI equipment back in 2016 and uh, lead to where we are today. So, what we can see here is uh, just after that burn has gone through, it's really about mop-up. And so that is the identifying all the hotspots, particularly in what we call the uh, blackout or uh, 30, 30 metres or 100 feet uh, from the fire perimeter. And, uh, and certainly you can see in a quick context of a minute or so how uh, easy it is for the drones to actually quantify where those uh, hotspots are and therefore um, decide on a bit of an action plan, look at the upcoming weather, uh, look at the resources available, and really focus and target um, those resources onto that fire line. Um, just for your interest in terms of the pallet uh, that's being used in that thermal camera there, um, I've put some of the settings there in the slides, and I'm sure um, afterwards you'd be able to have a look at those. Predominantly, we fly with uh, ISO 7 uh, Black Hot, um, iron bow and then a temperature range of around that 50, 65, 150. But we refine that later in clearance flights as we're looking for more and more detailed hotspots um, down to lower ranges. So we needed to um, now bring that information into how the firefighters can use it on the ground. Uh, here's another small fire. Um, now in this case here, we're not looking at blacking out just the perimeter. Um, just to the left of this image is actually New Zealand's um, aluminium smelter, and so therefore it's, it's a high risk location. So what we wanted to do is make sure that this entire fire uh, was cold and, uh, and extinguished. So what we can see here is a whole range of little dots um, up in the uh, sector Bravo there, um, each with a number on them. Um, those are the hotspots that have been identified by the drones, 
uh, during the sortie flights, which simply occur at night. And we give these to the firefighters uh, to then uh, action those and uh, locate them and extinguish them. The, the real key here is resources. So um, in this particular case, what we can see is we've gone from about 34 hotspots and quickly the following day with a follow-up flight, we can see we're only down to four. So with a crew of 10 on the ground, um, covering in this case a uh, you know, small 70 hectare fire, um, using apps like uh, FireMapper for Enterprise there, uh, they can navigate their way around, locate those hotspots and uh, extinguish those. And so, in that previous burn that I showed, um, that had actually been planned for like a six day mop up uh, with a crew of 10 staff and machinery. Um, what actually happened having the drone on site is we had 10 staff for a day, we dropped to a crew of three the following day and the fire was declared out. So you can see how effective the drones can do to reduce resources on the fire ground. Just to bring context and, and what we're actually looking for, this is a typical fire briefing uh, now. So firefighters are downloading the latest maps onto their smartphones uh, in the early morning. They're also typically carrying uh, small handheld thermal cameras as well. And you can see a, a typical hotspot on the right there. But to bring context in what we're trying to find and why drones are really useful in locating these hotspots is uh, here I am actually with the Venza maps loaded on the left hand side. I've been given a map during my briefing, and I'm walking down a fire break that's been put in in the control of this particular wildfire. Uh, this wildfire is several thousand hectares, and in this case here, we've just done, uh, the drones have done a perimeter flight. So actually they've just surveyed in uh, the first uh, 100 feet and located hot spots within that uh, 30 metre uh, perimeter. And so as you, Sort of note that I'm walking through here, you can see how difficult it is A, to navigate in this type of terrain, the, the varied fuels, um, obviously the, the close vicinity of unburnt and burnt fuels. And these are typically our zones where uh, hotspots will uh, sit and sit there idle, very hard to detect. Um, and then with the change of weather, increasing winds, um, this is where we get escaped from our fire line and where that, that particular hotspot uh, takes off on us. If you have a look, um, as I'm navigating in with, in this case, the Venza maps on the left hand side there, uh, I'm looking around for this hotspot. Hotspots aren't typically at this stage of mop up something that's flaring up and a lot of fire and, and so on. Um, typically, not even smoke, to be honest. And so, as on a particular hotspot that that drone flight uh, that was conducted the previous night has provided that intel for. And so what we're looking at here is a small ash pit um, located beside the stump, typically indicated by sort of that white ash colour on the top, that's indicating that it's still very much burning. And we can see there with the thermal camera um, very quickly um, giving us uh, you know, a high temperature reading uh, in that particular instance. So it looks pretty inconspicuous, um, but as you can see, in this case, you know, a small white ash pit sitting next to a stump, digging that up, that's about half a metre deep. And what we can see here is that it's sitting at well over 330 degrees uh, Celsius. Um, which is a really good indicator that that is a severe threat to breaching uh, this particular fire line as uh, RH um, changes and wind conditions uh, increase. So as we started identifying these hot spots we, and working with on-ground firefighters, we quickly discovered that they actually wanted a little bit more intel than just a, a dot on a map. And so we started breaking out the hotspots in really uh, temperature extremes, but also priority extremes. And a little bit of context of, of what the hotspot was telling us. Uh, remember most of our uh, UAS or drone operations are being flown with sensor operators um, using the thermal cameras, which are actually firefighters. 
And so they have the experience in actually being in there on the shovel, uh, digging out these hot spots, really understanding what they're seeing through the camera. And so they can give uh, a priority. And we use these uh, drop pins uh, from extreme, a typical hotspot. Um, instead of tagging a whole heap of hotspots, maybe in a, in a small debris pile or, or around uh, a number of stumps or, or the likes, we often tag a cluster of hotspots. That gives the firefighter an indicator that um, you know, within a 15 metre radius, uh, they can uh, dig up that whole area and find uh, that ground fire. And uh, there are times when we're, we're just going and flying over areas which are just extremely hot. A crew needs to get in there first or, or we're trying to identify the fire boundary. And so we use green tag for that. Um, where we see um, point number 47 up on the top left hand corner there, that's really just a, an indicator for us that we can see a bit of a, a, a sweet spot in terms of um, the temperature range that it's giving us on the drone. And so we mark that as a potential hotspot. And what we say is that while, you know, if you've got limited time in the day, you'll send your crew in to target the extreme hotspots, get those priorities out of the way. If you've got more time available, you'll be dealing with the, the hotspots and the clusters. And then you'll typically send your sector supervisor, a fire observer or a crew leader um, across to inspect the potential hotspots. We still tag those because often um, they can be just a, a sheet of metal, uh, for example, that's just uh, accumulated a lot of heat during the fire, but they could also be just a small indicator of a, a major ground fire, um, and we're just seeing a pinhole of heat coming out from underneath a, a, a ground fire situation, if that makes sense. And of course, uh, we use the blue hotspots from time to time um, to indicate um, that those hotspots have been extinguished uh, by the field crews. So yeah, quite colourful maps at times. You can see a range of, of uh, sort of the kinds of maps and intel that we provide to the firefighters on the ground. Again, using those apps like uh, Venza Maps and uh, Biomapper for Enterprise. And you can see how much intel those coloured dots uh, provide those firefighters and how they're actually going to tackle that fire. So if they're, if they're coming into that area late in the afternoon, they've got a limited amount of time, let's get in, deal with the red. Um, and then go into the orange and the yellow, and also um, being able to send that sector supervisor around, et cetera, to have a look at those purple hotspots, make a plan, decide on what we're going to do with those uh, and how serious they are. Or if they're just a, a piece of uh, hot sheet iron that's been heated up by the fire. Um, so just bring into context what these hotspots often look like. Um, this is a fire crew working on uh, one of those particular hotspots. In this case here, what would have been marked as a yellow one. And, uh, and so it was a range of heat that we were seeing around the end of a bulldozer control line. Uh, for those familiar with fire, very typical situation. Uh, for those firefighters, they didn't really see anything on the ground, again. Um, but you can see just by putting a shovel into that fire, how much um, that, that hotspot actually flares up and the importance of being able to find these um, efficiently on the ground, cover large amounts of area quickly. Um, I had some very similar experiences um, stepping out of the Southern Hemisphere now to deploying into British Columbia and Canada in 2018. Uh, really excited to be able to travel over there. Um, obviously I was just working um, as ground crew sector supervisor uh, for the wildfires there in their 2018 fire season, but um, had the opportunity to work alongside some of the incident management teams, talk to them a little bit, convince them that there was a couple of drone companies, uh, in this case Hummingbird Drones and Savia uh, UAS, and get them in to actually have a go on a couple of the fires. Again, the incident controllers were pretty new to drones, they didn't really know what the potential advantages were. Um, but coming from our experience in the Southern Hemisphere, it was fantastic to be able to enlighten them and use them. Um, great experience in the sense that we had that drone team come in. Um, we we're on a complex of fires uh, that particular year. That drone team from that day one in delivering a map like this carried on and was full time for the rest of the season. So amazing to see um, the benefits in, in that coming in. So you can see, again, supplying maps um, coming through those dots and actually bring it into context that 
walking into that fire line and that hot spot uh, that I showed before, that was actually one of those uh, hot spots uh, in Canada. And I did that video to actually inform and, and share with uh, BC Wildfire and the team over the year about how beneficial uh, those drones were in terms of locating those hot spots. Uh, one of the other things that we've found is that um, it's really hard for on-ground firefighters to grab context in both smaller and larger fires. And, uh, and I came across this not only with my breadth of experience coming from uh, fighting fire, but also sitting at the heli base um, during the day and sector supervisors, crew leaders coming up and saying, hey, look, we've been into sector Charlie for you know the last two days digging out and, and cleaning up this fire. And I just need to get up in the air and see where I am. <laughs> because um, it's really difficult for me to direct crews and operations if I can't really get a good, good feeling for the fire ground. And so um, what we said is, well, actually, why don't we put the drones up, collect a whole range of panoramics, um, hand them out in the briefing in the morning using their smartphones with QR codes, and, uh, and suddenly they can have, in an essence, uh, the, the likelihood of sort of Google Street View, but actually as waypoint um, panoramics uh, delivered now. Of course, with the Matrice um, 300 and the H20 camera, um, the ability to collect these is, is greatly improved and I'm sure the team here at DJI will cover that later in the session. But you can see um, from a sector supervisor perspective, how much context this brings to this large wildfire. This wildfire in this case is about uh, three to 4,000 hectares and, and of course spread over a number of sectors. So putting these um, uh, panoramics up, uh, allowing sector supervisors, incoming shift changes of rostered crews uh, and incident management teams, they can really put into context the, the meaning of the fire. And actually privileged enough that this particular image has got a couple of firefighters and if you zoom in uh, sharply enough on the top left hand corner, you can see he's actually got a smartphone out and he's locating a hotspot. <laughs> so that's pretty neat. <clears throat> uh, the other thing I um, just want to mention is uh, some of our other work, I guess, which is outside of um, core fire, but certainly in forestry, is that monitoring of, of hog piles and chip piles uh, for combustion threat, um, particularly around some of our pulp mills. Uh, here in New Zealand. And so what you can see is the typical kind of uh, thermal imagery, again, with that kind of black hot uh, iron bow isotherm uh, being able to be shown up in the, uh, the top right-hand corner. We can see the chip pile itself um, and the way that the sensor operator is using the uh, sort of temperature window to show them the hottest spots, um, as well as some temperature alarms to warn them of those, those areas. And of course, zooming in there, we can actually see that, can, that uh, composting going on and uh, the heat of that pile. And of course, we can send machinery in there, we can move that around, uh, reduce that risk and, and therefore uh, eliminate that from, from getting in, uh, on fire. And of course, on the bottom left-hand side, what you're actually seeing is the new DJI Flight Hub 2 uh, being used in that same context just last week. And so you can see um, in this case here, uh, dialing into DJI Flight Hub 2, uh, being able to see a live view of the drone flying around, the camera feed, and also dropping those, those hotspots um, through here uh, in that context. So again, just uh, the kind of um, intel being gathered uh, during one of those surveys, being able to extract that data as a KML, uh, prepare that data and deliver it into um, actionable uh, information that those machine operators can, can go and deal with in this particular case. So, the, I mean, the on-ground feedback has been fantastic since day one, to be fair. And uh, from that context, there isn't many wildfires or certainly larger wildfires in New Zealand that now don't have drone deployments um, to those locations. Um, New Zealand, <coughs> Fire and Emergency New Zealand have upskilled uh, a range of their urban search and rescue teams 
uh, to be deployed with drone technology, um, all of which or most of which is, is CGI, and using it in the context of, of clearing wildfires, uh, as well as a whole range of other uses, which I'm sure um, Chief will be talking about later. And just a little video there of, of some of our operations um, running. Uh, typically, the, the drones are deployed through the evenings. Um, maps are prepared by 6 a.m. in the morning and uh, typically operating as a three-man crew, crew leader, uh, sensor operator, and a pilot. Um, you can also see some of the apps we're using. Um, in this case here, Tag Pilot uh, from Maps Made Easy, um, but also, of course, uh, the new DJI Pilot there as well in the new context. Just want to acknowledge uh, Fire and Emergency New Zealand, uh, particularly the USAR team, Urban Search and Rescue, uh, and all the work they're doing to deploy drones around here in New Zealand. Uh, certainly my own brigade, um, Maker Carica, and some of the forestry companies that we've been working with, uh, Timberland, Science Research, uh, Department of Conservation, we've published a couple of papers on the use of drones uh, during wildfires. And, and of course, uh, experience there in uh, North America with BC wildfire, Saudi Air, hummingbird drones. And some of those apps that I've mentioned, um, Drones Made Easy, Tag Pilot, Firefront Solutions, Fire Mapper, and certainly Avenza Maps are those common tools that are out on the fire ground for delivering this information. So thanks again, uh, Wayne. Thanks again, Grant. Uh, and really appreciate being able to share this uh, with your viewers. That's some really great information. And <clears throat> I, I really appreciate you sharing with that. That's a, a lot of things that, that I just learned too in there, which is why I love doing these things. I learn just as much as I'm sharing. And so um, it's, it's really great to see a lot of the integration that you guys have been able to, to get out there and push the envelope. So thank you so much for sharing uh, that. Um, Mine, real quick right now, is just talking about, uh, you know, I, even though I'm a retired, I mentioned I'm still on a regional team uh, that responds to incidents um, as were requested uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And um, this actually was uh, in my old, uh, the area I used to be fire chief at near my home. And uh, my wife actually was returning home from the grocery store saw the fire sent me a, a another picture of it and uh right then we we got the alert to to respond uh and so this is the view i had from the ground responding to the fire and then when you arrive on scene oh there we go now it wants to catch up this that's the great thing about technology right a little bit of a lag there for me so this is what I call a steering wheel view. And when I arrived on scene, uh, when I was an incident commander, a lot of times this is this is a view we get, whether we be on the ground on an engine um, uh, or in your chief's buggy. And you know, there's there's not a lot of information for me there. And I've I've talked about it repeatedly in the past. Why, um, especially this aerial just even without having to worry about thermal that aerial view uh, with just a visible light camera is extremely important and uh, you can see how close this fire in fact came to several homes uh, and structures um, and so one of the things about this fire uh, that was difficult for the incident commander was communication uh, across the fire uh, as the smoke as the fire progressed wooded area, the smoke conditions uh, increased. Um, situational awareness for the crews, um, as David mentioned a minute ago, was, was extremely diminished. And you can see the difference between a thermal view and uh, the visible light view uh, right there. And so now the incident commander was able to talk with the pilot, see what they had, and now give better direction to where they wanted units to be, uh, especially for um, protection of the structures, uh, as well as those that might be doing indirect or direct attack. 
Um, and and I'll mention the, the the incident commander on this fire is a seasoned uh, wildland firefighter uh, and uh, crew leader, uh, as well as strike team leader, um, deploying across the state and the country. So um, while this may have been smaller in scale than some of what we, we've talked about, uh, it was still uh, quite intense for the incident commander at the time. And one of the things that we were um, uh, able to do that uh, David was pointing out, which was phenomenal, is now with Flight Hub 2 and with the pinpoints, we are able to drop pinpoints in the area to uh, give more information to the incident commander to be able to refer back to. And, and one thing that was also interesting is there was a spot fire that was detected by the drone pilot. And again, it was in the wooded area where nobody was able to see it, as you can see right here, uh, and going back to that ground level view. So uh, that was able to be relay relayed to the incident commander and he was able to take action on that. This was the fire area. And this is something we were able to do again with new flight hub two that uh, was, was really great. Uh, uh, I wish I'd had this years ago. I was excited years ago when, and I'm, date, I'm dating myself a little bit here, when we had iPads and I was able to get this, just, just a satellite view of where I was at. Um, that's why what David was talking about earlier, where they were able to give the crews that panoramic view uh, every day to see what they were dealing with. So with Flight Hub 2, now as we can see, we have the satellite view but we're able to go in and map. Um, now this isn't going to be uh, high quality mapping, but it's going to give you a good map of what you have at the time. In this case, we came back and were able to assist the uh, uh, investigators with this uh, map, but we're able to map out that in uh, this, I believe was about 20 acres. Sorry, David, I don't know what, what it would be in hectares, <laughs> but, um, we were able to, to do this in about uh, 10 minutes uh, of, of flight time and prep. And through the cloud mapper uh, ability, it will um, map that in real time. So as you're sitting there in Flight Hub, you're able to start to see the pictures populate out as well as the pinpoints uh, when, when you have the pinpoints in there. And then what we were able to do from there is even put points to the perimeter so that now we knew the area that we had uh, for, the, for the fire area. Uh, so this gave us the size of the fire it, it, or helped with uh, establishing the uh, containment line for the fire and going beyond there. So a little just quick brief, and that was uh, one of the things I didn't mention in that fire is that that was the first time uh, a Matrice 30T was able to be used uh, on a wildfire. We were actually, uh, Garrett Brill and I were beta testing that unit and um, able to respond with it and a Matrice 300. Um, and I, I will say uh, it was great having that Matrice 30T just because of the time it took me to be able to get the... Uh, the 300 up in the air versus the 30, a uh, huge difference. While they're both great uh, platforms, uh, in this case, the uh, Matrice 30 was, was, was better prepared for it. So we just wanna really quickly talk about um, uh, some of the capabilities we have out there. And we've talked a little bit about mapping. Um, so uh, we just wanna delve in a little bit more on why the mapping is important. Uh, and that's beforehand. And when we're looking at, you know, strategies for the brush clearance, uh, maybe fire lines, uh, areas that uh, are of concern, um, as uh, Grant and I work, did some work with uh, LA Fire Department uh, last year with Eric Ward, David Danielson, Captain Kalnitz, uh, and looking at Mendocino County, or excuse me, Canyon area and uh, helped uh, do some mapping that would be beneficial for their brush clearance um, uh, program, as well as, you know, this is great 
for giving information to homeowners showing, hey, you have these threats in your, in your property around your home. Now you can take that and help them make a plan for creating defensible space around their home. And then, uh, you know, monitoring when crews might need to come back to that area for some clearing uh, and cleanup. And as well as now you have a before and after picture to compare uh, to what the area was before and maybe post fire. Uh, and just real briefly, I'm gonna to touch on, I did a, uh, a, a topic uh, at Airworks here not too long ago about multispectral and the use of multispectral uh, in pre-planning uh, is, is becoming really a good use case for drones, uh, including our Phantom 4 multispectral. And in this case, you see these pictures on the, the bottom right here that over time you start to see, um, in this case, in these pictures, the red is healthy green vegetation, green is uh, maybe stressed and yellow is, is dead or dying. Uh, and then on the right, you can start to see uh, some of the changes um, in the vegetation as, as over just a matter of a few weeks, it might start to uh, dry out and conditions get worse. Uh, and that leads especially uh, in some areas to where uh, the fire authority can start to say, okay, no more outdoor burning, uh, even down to, hey, uh, you know, people that are outside welding, welding pipes, and things like that need to uh, restrict their, their their operations simply because of the high fire danger. And now you also have something to quantify it and to give them uh, to get that information across. Um, and then after a fire mapping, a little bit like I was showing uh, a minute ago, uh, you're, you're getting that updated imagery. Um, Dave just showed tremendous use of hotspots. So I don't want to go too much more in depth there, but uh, being able to uh, you know, as I was talking with Grant earlier, uh, it, and Dave, it was great you mentioned it. it. It backed up what I was talking with Grant about. But that ground level view that you're looking at, you may not be seeing those signs like smoke. And and it was great to see you you talk about from the aerial thermal. We were able to see this was a hot spot, and now yes, there are the ground handheld Im uh, thermal imagers. Uh, but, you know, now in combination with those, now when they go to that general area, they can use those to really say, yeah, that, that's an area uh, we need to dig down into. Uh, because in some locations, as you know, those can burn for a very long time, um, even down in the root system. So, um, again, measuring the area uh, that has burned, uh, as well as potential to, to measure what, what was saved. Uh, where the stop loss occurred. And again, getting that comparative uh, analysis. So I'm gonna be quiet now and let Grant carry on. Uh, he's got some good information to, to back up a lot of this as well. Thanks, Chief. Continuing on here, just wanna talk a little bit about the workflow for mapping. I know we have a variety of experience levels on the webinar today, but just running through the workflow quickly here, you essentially, uh, open the application that you're using with your drone. Um, if there isn't a DJI one available, odds are there will be a mobile SDK application with most of our drones too that you could use for mapping. You can kind of see the lines here as different applications go with different drones as you know, but we'll take DJI Pilot for experience. you would be able to draw the area that you'd like to map, put in the parameters, use the drone to collect the data, you can then process that data. We have two options here shown, our DJI Flight Hub 2, which is cloud-based, and DJI Terra, which is computer-based. And then from there, you have your 2D map that you can obviously utilize to help make decisions. Touching a little bit more on the Flight Hub 2, as that's what's a bit new on our side, we have the ability, as Chief mentioned, to plan that mission. You can see the drone essentially is flying in a lawnmower pattern. And as the drone is flying along, the images will upload to the Flight Hub 2 platform, and that map begins to stitch. 
So you can see some efficiency numbers here in regards to how much uh, you can technically map with the drone. And then also the fact just realizes is an online mapping. So if it's an area where you have connectivity and you're able to upload the imagery, this is certainly a good option that can be used. But if you have connectivity issues or problems, it's important to consider other options such as DJI Terra on the offline side. And also a variety of other solutions to capture, process, and share data. Ultimately, it's just important to find what works for your team. On the Flight Hub 2 side, that supports the M300 with the H20 series and the M30 series, specifically for your knowledge. DJI Terra supports all of our DJI drones along with a variety of other additional cameras. And that's going to be on a Windows computer requiring some processing power as any offline photogrammetry software does. So just something to be aware of there as well. And then something previously had discussed with Dave and Chief, flying at a higher altitude for a lot of these post fire situations or you know, in the mop up stage is gonna save you a lot of time and you don't really need super key details on the ground in a lot of these scenarios. So you're gonna save yourself processing and capture time by flying at a higher altitude. And I like this quote here too, from one of the firefighters I, I talked to, he made a couple jokes about himself being a firefighter and, and technology, but final thing he said was people don't realize how it's so simple to fly a mapping mission of the area. So I think that's really something people maybe don't quite realize. So would encourage you to try it out with one of the, the drones you have if you, you haven't. And, you know, there's kind of free trials available to different softwares as well of ours and others out there as well. One more thing too to touch on is Panorama. If you're in an area with uh, limited network connectivity or you're just looking for a quick overview of the scene without doing that post-processing, Dave touched on it, but some of the benefits there, you can capture a Panorama in one click. Pretty much all DJI drones have the option. And then this whole Panorama that you're seeing here on the right side, is only 30.6 megabytes for this one specifically. So, so much data in such a small size uh, compared to 2D mapping, which takes a little more as you're uploading all of those individual photos. You can also see it here on the Flight Hub 2 platform where you can display it directly on the map. One Dave had mentioned before, it was called roundme.com. There's some other similar sites out there as well where you could host a panorama and then share that link as a QR code out to Teams. Do note here, it's not a 2D map, so you can't measure distances or location. You're really just adding the specific location where the panorama was captured, as you can see on the map. But it's something that we've seen definitely deployed by the, the fire service. Um, Dave, I know you touched on panoramas earlier. Anything I'm missing on that or you'd want to add? Oh, sorry, I think you're muted. All right. Yeah, that. No, that's fantastic, Grant. And it is a real key to uh, to the intel. Um, often, you know, satellite imagery and so on is great, but it, you know, in these situations, it's often cloudy, it's often uh, smoke ridden, etc. And and so even getting aerial photography early in the fire is difficult. Whereas these panoramics, very really quick and easy, give so much intel to both the uh, incident management teams, but also just the, the guys on the ground. Um, you mentioned a note around um, being offline and online. Um, we've recently deployed uh, the Starlink uh, satellite receivers with our drone team um, with fantastic um, ability to then really deliver this type of connectivity you know, anywhere on the planet, really covered by that service. Wow, that's awesome. Good to hear. I'd uh, like to try that out myself uh, one day soon as well. Um, go ahead and pass it back over to Chief Baker here to kind of cover some of the key points and tips regarding collecting intel uh, during the fire. Yeah, uh, and again, Dave uh, covered a lot of great, great things. Uh, probably pretty much everything we we're about to go over. Uh, uh, it, it was really great to, to hear and listen to. But, you know, during a fire, um, I, I talk about it as incident commander or uh, in Dave's area, I believe you call, call them incident controllers. Um, it, it, having that intelligence of not only where's the fire, where's it at, where's it going, what's ahead of it, those are all important things uh, that, that you get, the fire speed, the fire's direction, but then also 
uh, again, as, as we've mentioned, the, the property and life threats uh, ahead of the fire. And one other thing that I early on recognized was going to be very important was uh, finding escape routes and safety zones for the firefighters uh, to, to be able to identify, identify those really rapidly for them, even maybe direct crews uh, that, that may be about to be overrun to a good safety zone. Um, you know, I, I say all the time, I do what I do uh, here at DJI because uh, these tools save the save lives. They save the lives of firefighters, police officers, and, and those that uh, they're sworn to protect. So uh, this is just another great use right there on, on a wildland fire. Uh, and then they can also be helped with uh, determining when and where evacuations may need to occur because we're getting that information there, uh, as I just mentioned. Um, and then that, that marking of key areas, we, we keep kind of talking about it, but it is so great to finally be able to do that because I kind of mentioned, as I said before, I was excited back when iPads came out and I could start using an iPad. And one of the things I used was the markup tool, screenshotting and texting that out. And now we can be marking those uh, areas of interest, putting down the uh, pinpoint. Again, it, it requires a, an M30T or the Patrice 300 with an H20T uh, laser and the laser rangefinder. But having those um, are, are just tremendous. Uh, and, and if you have anything you want to add in there, Dave, please, by all means, do. Yeah, I think, I think you know, just that context of, um, yeah, escape route, safety zones, or even access. Um, we had one particular um, incident where uh, the drone was able to identify a breakout from a fire line about sort of one and a half kilometres away. Um, the fire crew at the time just used a, a simple uh, Mavic Advance to, to fly over there, um, was able to um, assess the situation, but also flick around, look at how to actually get into that area, you know, and, and then, of course, be on the radio um, and bring that, actually, that appliance um, in to be able to tackle that, that small breakout. So, yeah, without doubt, just that, that overall context um, up in the air is, is amazing. Yeah, absolutely. A safer, a safer route in. I actually had a fire uh, I, uh, a little bit before I retired that I had no access for the crews that I had on scene, but luckily I had additional crews coming in and I was able to give them a better uh, direct access into the area I need them. So absolutely good, good point there. Um, and then this is something uh, else, uh, you know, coordination with crew aircraft um you know obviously crude aviation they're using adsb and we can be using that to um to receive that so we have a better understanding of where the uh those assets are um which is great because it's uh, been improved in in the pilot app to uh no more as as i called it before cry wolf now you know if you're getting that alert that aircraft is in your area approaching you and at a altitude that uh, may cause some confliction. So um, you get it through your, through your map view and you also will see on the uh, picture here on the bottom right where the, it highlights out in your uh, uh, pilot camera view, um, your FPV view. So uh, that is really great. Um, and, and that's where coordination is extremely important when you have air assets. I know in the U.S. Uh, for uh, a lot of forestry services, if there's drones uh, in the area, they won't uh, allow the crude assets to come in. So now you know when they're coming into that area and land your, your drone aircraft or, or uh, risk mitigation there. Um, but it, it, it also involves having that relationship with them to be able to get better integrated and letting crewed aircraft pilots uh, come to your, your trainings, uh, see how you're utilizing the technology um, and, and the, the way we're leveraging it. Um, they're able to better understand, um, you know, what we're doing and how we can work alongside them at the same time. And that's one question I have for you, Dave. Have you guys, uh, I know in British Columbia, you mentioned you guys were doing some work, but have you guys 
uh, had any advances in coordinating uh, with your crude air assets. Certainly, um, so that all our UAS uh, drone operations fall under the air commander and, and also the delegates, ESX supervisors, et cetera. Um, the drones are typically tasked by the intelligence unit uh, within the incident control structure, um, but they are directly under operation with the air commander. So in terms of airspace segregation, they can work um, directly with entitlement um, of typically a no-fly zone over an area or to a certain altitude. Um, the advancement of ads receivers in the device is, is fantastic. Um, particularly, I'd have to just make a special mention of that pilot view, um, where you can actually see, just like the tags we're pasting for hotspots, you can actually see the aircraft. Um, it's a bit faint in that diagram, but it's the yellow sort of uh, text and imagery um, in the sky there, and gives so much context to, to the pilot and the safety of the operation. Absolutely, yeah. And now we want to talk real quick about some of the uh, thermal settings, just um, because uh, you know there is there's a lot when it comes to thermal, and we could we could uh, have a whole other webinar uh, and 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 uh, on the thermal. And uh, um, but one thing to point out is the way we're able to get a lot of these, uh, as especially as Dave was showing, the use of of the isotherm is that these are radiometric sensors, so each pixel is getting the temperature reading. And so we're able to, to uh, utilize that technology um, to give us, uh, as you see, we keep drawing, uh, showing a box drawn out, you see a blue dot, red dot, and those are giving the hottest and coldest temperatures it, that it's measuring in those areas. Um, now, one key thing is altitude is, is an issue. So if you're at a really high altitude and back a ways, um, there is gonna be, um, some uh, issues in getting a, a correct reading on those. Uh, but in this case, you can see uh, they're, they've drawn the box out and we have our uh, high low temperatures that can help us get an idea of setting out the isotherms. Uh, but then we also have uh, the difference between the high and the low gain uh, and we'll show you a quick video here. This is a department doing a, a live burn, and you can see, uh, uh, actually I'll let Grant real quick mention this, uh, go over this. Uh, I think you do a better job explaining it than me. <laughs> yeah, no worries, but this is just an example here where you can see here at the beginning, they're in the low gain mode, so you have a lot more detail on the fire because the temperature range is going all the way up to 1,022 degrees Fahrenheit, and then, when we move on here into the high gain mode, you can see that the fire just kind of comes be like grainy on the screen there because it's essentially all reading as 302 degrees Fahrenheit, but you have a lot more information kind of around the fire if you had firefighters or, or teams outside there. So it's important to realize that that is a setting and depending on your drone, it could be auto, low or high, but depending on if you're trying to look at the fire or you're trying to look at what's around, it's important to have the proper gain mode selected. You can see up here, once again, the max temperature is showing up as 336 because it is in high gain mode. Sometimes it'll go over a little of that 302, but that fire is actually a lot hotter. It's just the gain mode that's selected. Some of the other options like Dave talked about, we have the different palettes. He talked about black hot is one of the ones he'll end up using. And then also the isotherm to really quantify a specific temperature range. It is important to be careful with the isotherm side because if you have something outside of that isotherm range, it's not gonna show up in the color palette that you've selected. But once again, getting your bearings beforehand with the temperature uh, box here is, can be a useful tool so you have a good understanding of, of what those temperatures are at. So I well, like Chief said, a lot to learn and go into on the thermal side but just wanted to at least touch on those key settings to make sure you all are aware of those. And one thing to point out on the pallets is don't, don't ever get stuck with one pallet, you know, oh, I like this one or this one's a cooler looking one. Um, each one can give you a little bit better definition uh, for what you're, you're trying to look for in different situations. Um, and additionally on the isotherms, um, 
you know, it, it's good to be able to, uh, Dave showed a really good video with the chip on the hog pile uh, of being able to, instead of looking at everything there, dial in, this is what we're, this area is what we're really looking for uh, to, to get that. So that was really a, a great uh, demonstration there. Anything you'd like to add on this, Dave? Yeah, certainly um, key attributes, the radiometric camera. Um, the, the fact that fire's hot really is on our side in the sense that um, while we're not after measuring um, every degree of, of temperature, um, we can really use those isotherms to really focus uh, the sensor operators, the pilots, um, on the capture of good intel. And certainly um, you'll find uh, you know, a good sweet spot in terms of what those settings should be. Um, to, to be able to do that, and I provided some suggestions before. Um, agree with Wayne uh, around the different pallets um, for fire. We, we tend to find um, the black hot ISO because it gives lots of context to the pilot while he's flying, um, but also the iron bow to give lots of context to the sensor operator and his, and his tagging of those hot spots. Um, but also there's, there's a number of other pallets which are, are there and equally just as good um, at times, particularly um, when operating at night and, and uh, being able to see different kinds of temperature ranges. Yes, absolutely. So uh, just recapping again, and, and we're, we're uh, going over it again and again, Dave did a great job talking about it. But again, going back to the hot spots, um, you know, we say uh, all the time, at least in my area, there's no such thing as a rekindle. It's just a fire we didn't put out. Um, and unless it's arson, it was started again. But uh, reducing that uh, potential to have to go back out, um, that, that spread uh, or escape from the containment line is really important. Uh, and in this case, we actually see um, Orange County Fire Authority, uh, working with Irvine Police, um, which is another great point I want to make is nothing has integrated police and fire that I've ever seen as much as drones has, has integrated us and gotten us working together. Um, so uh, really great to, to see this. And uh, in this case, Irvine flying for uh, Orange County Fire Authority. Uh, on the Pico Fire and Rancho, uh, Rancho Mission Viejo. So um, great to see that there. Um, you know, we're focusing on the fire perimeter first and then, you know, maybe working our, our way in as, as uh, Dave was showing um, to that, uh, you know, containment area. Um, if you are working in operations uh, where you're not with the incident commander, you definitely want to look at having a liaison that can re be relaying that information. Um, and uh, I noticed it in uh, my experience early on, not just on wildfires, on um, uh, structural fires uh, where they were lost uh, and we were working an overhaul through a pile, but uh, it's great to see Grant was able to get some quantification of some times and that's everywhere from getting overhaul times down to uh, 20, uh, I guess you're saying they're 20, 20 hours or 20 minutes to six hours uh, it could have taken and you're reducing those times down uh, dramat dr dramatically, correct? Yep, yeah, in this uh, example, they were down from 20 to six hours there, yep. Got it, yeah. And then, uh, and Definitely, we, we agree with that, uh, um, and we see that see a lot, uh, fire from fire. And, and why that's also important, you know, is is not just are we talking about we're getting crews back in service, but when a majority of firefighters, at least in the U.S., are, are volunteer, and I'm sure that's pretty similar, uh, Dave, you being also having a, a volunteer background, as I recall you saying, um, that that's getting these crews back um, not only in service to tackle other emergencies, uh, but that's able to get them back home to, to their families uh, as well. So uh, tremendous value uh, in, in reducing that time, increasing efficiency. Um, so we, we have here um, 
again, kind of going with what uh, Dave was showing with uh, being able to coordinate crews and get them directed into an area that, you know, that differing ground view from what you're seeing in the air is really important. Uh, and having that zoom capability with the H20 and, uh, uh, and the M30 series is really great. Uh, and you do have some zoom on the thermal camera as well. Um, so that's important to remember, uh, not just on the visible light camera to be able to, to zoom in and, and see that area. Um, I know we've talked quite a bit about this, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on. And, and Grant, I'm gonna let you go with this one. Yeah, just uh, reviewing some of the options you have to mark and share the hotspots. And it's interesting, Dave, Dave does these both or has done them both. So you could mark spots with uh, one of our payloads that has a laser rangefinder, like the H20 series or the M30. Or there's a mobile SDK application called Tag Pilot. I know it's compatible with M200, among a couple other solutions there. So that's kind of your opportunities to mark the points. And then from there, you can have the ground team pull up Flight Hub 2, which we're still optimizing on the mobile side, or if they're already integrated with a mapping service, such as Dave mentioned, you can export the data from the tag pilot from Flight Hub 2, and then import that into the third-party software. So screenshots are here, but you can see there's an export KML button there for Flight Hub 2. And then you could organize these points into folders if you want to put all of your red, for example, into one photo, export those you could, or if you want to leave some behind, you have the option too. So that import export allows the software to kind of work across your different platforms that you may be deploying there. Um, and then here we had just added on some additional notes and, and news stories we had seen, uh, drones being a positive media story with a couple over the past few days that our PR team had shared with us. And then I want to pass it back over to uh, Chief here to talk, talk about a few of these items. Yeah, absolutely. I'll um, just real quick, we talked about, and it was great again, <laughs> keep saying this, I know, but it is great that Dave was able to show some real examples of, of what we had already been uh, looking to talk about, um, you know, um, but you're going to be operating in those environments where soot and ash is getting on your aircraft. And, um, you know, even though we do have a good IP rating on the aircraft, it's important to, to uh, make sure you get the soot, the ash uh, blown out with air compressor, uh, wipe down of the aircraft, uh, blades included. Uh, don't, don't neglect that area, blow out in the motor areas. Just so, uh, you know, some of that ash can be um, corrosive to uh, some of the components. So we wanna make sure we get the uh, aircraft cleaned off pretty well. Um, as Grant just kind of mentioned, drones can be a very positive media story uh, for you if you're looking to start or enhance your program. Um, you know, and, and it's great to see uh, over the years how these media stories keep coming up, especially through like our drone live safe map that we have uh, where we can start to quantify that drones are making a difference. They are saving lives. And just real quick uh, um, along those lines, um, they're not just actively saving lives and, and they're also passively saving lives. And that is we may make a difference with a drone breaking that chain of events that could lead to um, you know, worsening of an incident or injury of personnel. And that, that's something we'll never probably realize. Uh, we can't necessarily quantify. So it's, it's great to, to know that uh, they are making a difference there as well. Um, and then, you know, we've talked about a lot of the, the response. The majority of what we talked about is how we're utilizing drones during a fire uh, in response to the fire. Uh, and, and as I'm sure Dave can uh, attest, greatest fire I ever went on was the one I never had. And so prevention is a huge thing. Uh, and, and so drones are being used in a lot of different ways to try and prevent fire. Dave, again, as I was saying, showed a great example with the chip and hog. But then we also have uh, uh, power line inspections being uh, conducted with drones and uh, that's just another way that hopefully we'll talk about, be able to talk about in the future that, that shows how these risks are being mitigated. So 
hopefully we've provided a lot of great information there. Uh, and again, I'm gonna hand back to, uh, to Grant. Thanks. And then I guess before we go into kind of solution summary here, Dave, um, any final notes from your side on our last couple slides? Uh, yeah, so just um, you yeah, reemphasize that, that firefighter safety, you know, the saving that firefighter from standing in that ash pit, um, you know, we've all done it. And, and knowing where it is beforehand is, is without doubt uh, a huge benefit. Um, just a note, I've sort of, I've used what, seen the drones deployed on very large fires and very small fires. Um, please do not exclude drones from, from either of those use cases. Um, in a large fire context, you'll probably have, you know, fixed wing or flare operating on, on helicopter platforms, et cetera. And I, I've been one of those operators myself. And I guess when you're flying around with those larger aircraft, manned aircraft, you're getting a greater context of, of um, the infrared signal across the, the fire ground. And what you can do is prioritise where you put the drones. You might be putting it in the urban rural interface. Um, you might be putting it around some key assets. And in acknowledging that those drones are still really useful in those particular zones. The other one, of course, is just that awareness of, of dense vegetation. And so we've got a tall canopy we've had it under under fire go through. Um, drones can still be really useful to see through that canopy because they're flying at a much slower speed and, and don't suffer from motion blur with these low resolution thermal cameras. So again, um, really able to target those key zones um, and combine with the benefits of the manned aircraft by fixing and uh, cutting platforms. So yeah, and that, that's something you bring up that we really we didn't quite focus on, and, and maybe we'll on another time. But you know, if we start to add in the lidar um, use as well, now we're getting through that tree canopy and starting to see maybe the terrain underneath and the hazards that it could uh, pose to firefighters, as well as how it could be affecting the uh, progress of the fire. Um, so good good point to bring up there as well. Yes, yes. Great stuff. So before we wrap things up today, I wanted to give a quick summary on kind of the solutions we talked about. I know we've been throwing out abbreviations, aircraft. So for those of you who are brand new to drones or curious about them, I want to try to summarize that very quickly. On our website, we have a lot more detailed information on the current enterprise drones and other drones that we have available. Um, but really our entry level drone to get a 640 thermal sensor, which is really an industry standard for a leading thermal sensor, you're looking at our Mavic 2 Enterprise Advanced. So that's really your most affordable option to get in with thermal sensor on the 640 side. Um, we have our Phantom 4 series, which you can do both visual and multi-spectral mapping with depending on which model is purchased. But once again, those are more entry-level affordable options to give you some high resolution mapping with both the visual side and then give you multi-spectral on the alternative. The Matrice 30T or M30T is our new flagship model that's portable. So it comes with all kind of our flagship enterprise features, but in a more portable package. And then finally on the hardware side, we have our Matrice 300 RTK, which we've recently released a new payload for called the H20N, which has two thermal sensors, which allows you to zoom in with the thermal camera by switching from one to the other to keep that higher resolution. There's also a variety of third-party sensors or DJI sensors, including LiDAR, mapping, thermal, zoom, et cetera, that you can use with the M300. And a big difference between that and the M30 is the payload capacity. The Flight Hub 2 software we talk, talked about works with both the M300 RTK and the M30T. And then our DJI Terra for offline processing of 2D maps and 3D models uh, can be used with any of these drones after collecting the data. Here's a quick comparison chart here too, just showing you that you're giving up a little bit of endurance with the Enterprise Advance compared to the M30 and M300 series. The visual camera of the M30, M300, uh, RTK plus the H20 series is, is very similar. The H20N is more optimized for night operations as it has starlight sensors and also the two thermal cameras. 
And then you have an IP rating for both the M30 and M300 aircrafts. You can see some different specs there as well, listed on our website for you as well. But obviously the M300 with the greater payload capacity, uh, all three of the options on the right, having the laser range finder, and then Flight Hub 2 compatibility uh, being the M30 and M300 as well as aforementioned. So hopefully that gives you some quick context on our hardware and software solutions. Certainly happy to cover any questions and our local enterprise dealers are always there to help as well. A few new solutions and applications we've seen while out at different roadshows, events, and conferences lately include the Ignis solution for controlled burns. It carries ping pong sized uh, ignition spheres filled with potassium permanagate. I'm not even gonna try to pronounce that, <laughs> but uh, we did. It has a, essentially you can find uh, different areas that you're targeting with the thermal cameter, monitor that controlled burn and drop the balls from the drone. We have an Enterprise Insights article we'll share after the webinar here with more information on that solution, but very cool to see that in action. Another one we have spoken with is called Roboto, which does live mapping of the fire while it is taking place. And the drone itself is actually able to determine its route based on the information from the thermal camera. So as it's going for a longer range, doesn't require the RC to drone connection. So new solution we've seen on the market, have not tested it ourselves, but just wanted to share one of these innovations in the space. And then finally, this one was at AUVSI called Life Seeker. Essentially locate phones with the device attached to the drone. Still going through some government approval, but there's been some promising testing here on the US side. So excited to see some of these new solutions and folks continue to innovate for public safety and the fireside alongside these DJI platforms. We'll be sending out some additional resources on Thursday via email. And then the recording of this webinar will be sent a few hours here after the conclusion. So I uh, want to thank Dave and Chief Baker for joining us today. And we'll go ahead and cover some questions from attendees. All right, a lot of great questions that we've gotten through thus far. But appreciate the additional ones rolling in. A few of the ones that we've gotten so far, that I know we answered in the chat, but I think would be good to share with other folks as well. Um, hopefully it's clear in regards to how you can mark hotspots from the air. So two options with the laser rangefinder or with the field of view of the camera and using a third party app. Both the recording and presentation will be planned to share after the webinar as well for those asking. Chief, I think this is maybe a good one for you to speak to. Um, for those who are drone pilots, how would they perhaps explore starting to help local teams out through mutual aid or assistance? I know it's something you have experience with working with civilians in regards to helping out on the fire side. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're talking civilians that are uh, drone pilots helping uh, with agencies. Uh, am I right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, that That's actually um, a great topic there. In fact, a lot of our success was through our civilian pilot. Um, one, one of the things uh, to do um, is go out and uh, just show the equipment to the agencies if they don't have a program already uh, and what your capabilities are with the equipment. And from there, you know, offering your assistance is, is one thing, but um, they're going to want to see your dedication and get you some training if, if, uh, if you're not able to get that ahead of time. And when, when I say training, uh, easily to obtain training, through uh, FEMA's online uh, courses for uh, ICS 100, 200, uh, 7, and 8 are a good starting point uh, because that gives you training. Now, this is in the United States. My apologies there. 
Um, but uh, this gives you good training on the incident command structure and how you are able to be integrated into that. Um, and when you do respond, uh, that you know how to uh, be a part of that incident command structure so that you're not freelancing or going rogue. And, and the worst time to, to approach a fire department to help is during an incident. They're not going to have time to vet you, uh, coordinate with you, or things like that. Um, so it's about building that relationship well ahead of time. Um, you know, again, I can also point to uh, Menlo Park Fire Department in California where uh, uh, they have Tom Owen, who is one of their uh, uh, several uh, non-sworn pilots. So uh, there, there are a lot of great instances out there. Um, in some agencies, this has been their biggest drawback to getting a program started when it comes to fire is that how do they staff a drone when they're already having a hard enough time staffing the engine crews for the fire. So um, that's something to point out to them is that, look, I can come and I can assist you. Um, and that's not adding staffing to get you this valuable equipment. Um, now, starting out, you may be utilizing your own personal equipment, uh, or you might be fortunate enough that the department is able to start uh, supplying with equipment uh, right away. Um, but if you are supplying your equipment initially, uh, as Garrett was for us, um, that helps the decision makers, though, see the value so that uh, as the program progresses, hopefully you're able to get budget or the department's able to get budget to purchase equipment there. So that was, that was a really great question. And I know that was a long answer to it, but uh, just because there's such a, uh, a lot to it. Yeah, thanks, Chief. That was a great, great response there and a lot of good information. We had an additional question about the use of the laser range finder um, and that regards to the accuracy. Obviously, you can use that to mark the points. And we have a formula on our website in regards to measurement accuracy where you plug in the distance to whatever you're looking at. And then you can see what the margin of error plus or minus would be when making that. Um, I want to ask this one to uh, David here. Has there been any use of tethered drones for your operations, or do you see a future for that? Oh, it looks like we might be having some audio issues for David. I guess, Chief, you want to hop in on that one? Yeah, um, it, you know, there's on a wildland fire, not always a lot of uses uh, because of a lot of times it's a, a rapidly progressing incident. Um, and, you know, uh, you, you may have a large area that the uh, tethered solution may not be uh, adequate for, but I do see times when it is uh, going to be useful. Um, and that is, you know, maybe operations where you've got the fire line contained and now you're just kind of trying to use it to monitor uh, crews in that area uh, from certain locations uh, and not wanting to keep moving uh, your drone operation. Um, plus, it, it, it could be a good way to integrate um, with the crude aviation assets in that they'll know, okay, in this location, there is a tethered drone being utilized. And so they'll have that in mind uh, as their terrain instruction um, when they're making their lower level flights. So uh, I, I, I definitely see that there can be some uses there for sure. And I would love to see um, uses found, uh, you know, just because I, I don't have more ideas on how they can be used doesn't mean that uh, somebody it's not going to be able to be out there to innovate and find new uses. So I would love to hear uh, later on. Cool, cool. Yeah, David, if you're able to get the mic working on uh, here and there, please uh, do let us know. But small technical difficulty there. We'll cover some of the technical questions here. Asking about being able to use the 
RC shortcuts for the Z15 Spotlight on the M300. That has been added to our M300 firmware, so the capability is there, and I know some SDK developers have added that, but have not seen that added by the Wingsland team for the Z15 at this time. Some of the newer payloads with the M30 are seeing the ability to use uh, the hotkeys with those integrated uh, directly. Um, in regards to copy of slides, we'll make sure to share recording and inf information after. Um, the Flight Hub 2 is not planned to support the Mavic 2 Enterprise Advanced in the future. And then going over a few of these other questions here. I guess it'd be a good one here to pass potentially to uh, David. Just we had a lot of questions about operating in mountainous terrain in regards to operating. So that's something you have. Uh, experienced on your end. Uh, you can hear me all right, Grant? Yes, sir. Yeah, yep. excellent. Uh, yeah, so um, particularly for those users that um, are in steep terrain, um, you've got that third-party app which Grant and I mentioned called Tag Pilot from the, the Maps Made Easy team. Um, that, that particular application allows you to load your DEM uh, or digital elevation model uh, into the software. And then um, you can actually lock out a altitude above ground. And so typically, um, let's say you're, you're operating in steep terrain, um, you can lock out a ground altitude of uh, 800 metres, say, uh, and therefore it takes away from the drone piloting the craft uh, up and down over the terrain. Uh, the craft itself, uh, wherever the pilot uh, pushes that craft, um, will ensure that it clears the ground by, by that 100 metres based on the digital elevation model. So really neat feature there to be able to do that. And many of you are probably familiar with flying uh, terrain following flights um, during sort of mapping survey uh, type flights. And, and having that functionality um, really makes it safe uh, operating at night uh, in particular in, in that steep terrain. Great, another one coming up here. Overall, how quickly can the hotspot or boundary tag maps be deployed to field crews in your experience, David? Yeah, so <clears throat> the key is, is being able to uh, generate tags and if needed be able to deliver those to the to the ground crews uh, straight away. Um, certainly um, our experience with products like uh, TagPilot, um, you can save that KML uh, directly um, even while the craft's in the air. You can uh, and deliver that to ground crews in some manner or form whether it be uh, something like airdrop or, or dropping a an email or, or the likes um, off to ground crews. Uh, same goes with uh, Pilot. Um, with the with the new Pilot app, um, you can actually save that as a KML um, on the controller uh, and deliver that to the, the field crews in that same manner. Uh, of course, with the Flight Hub 2, um, those uh, pins are all live and and directly divvied uh, to to the ground crews. Connectivity, um, you know, can always be an issue with wildfire um, operating in remote areas, etc. Um, and certainly, uh, I think I previously mentioned um, how uh, at least one of our crews is operating Starlink um, uh, satellite internet, uh, and that being portable in nature uh, gives them that ability to upload video uh, imagery information um, to the likes of Flight Hub uh, anywhere. Great answer, great answer. Um, start with uh, Chief on this next one, but aerial survey quality during the fire considerations with smoke when you're mapping or looking to get intel there? Yeah, and uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe, um, I know with some solutions we can do the mapping in thermal. Um, I haven't done one yet with the Flight Hub 2 cloud mapper, so I can't remember offhand uh, if we can do that but I know with the other mapping you can do thermal 
mapping as well as visible light mapping. So it helps both with during the fire, uh, as well as post fire overhaul, as well as uh, doing your um, investigation. So correct me if I'm wrong on that one, Grant. Cloud mapper can be done in thermal. Yeah, it can. I think something to realize is it's potentially going to take a bit more time on that just Correct. because of the lower resolution, but it absolutely can be done in Flight Hub 2, Terra, or other photogrammetry software. It's the same idea. You just need the overlap, but you're not going to have like quantitative temperature measurements on that. It's more of a general overview picture. Oh, there was one I saw uh, here a second ago, might be more for you, uh, Grant, about um, Light Hub, sorry. Um, no, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find it here. We've had a lot of great questions, so this is good. <clears throat> Um, I guess in the meantime, David, uh, operations with taller trees in the area, hills, areas, uh, in regards to your command and control signal, uh, do you try to designate a higher landing takeoff point with the RC or any strategies you'll use there? Uh, certainly, you're, you're typically planning um, your operations um, uh, across the, the sectorized fire. Um, you know, typically you're flying the, the perimeter um, and controlling the perimeter first. And so you'll be working to um, those flight perimeters that are, that are typically been given um, from the intelligence unit um, the day prior. And uh, certainly planning your flights along that perimeter uh, for as far as you, you know, uh, can fly. Um, there are some features in um, the software that is coming through, like movable home points and, and so on, that enable you to um, be able to extend that perimeter as you move around it. Uh, and certainly from uh, obstacles uh, slash trees, etc., cetera, um, often there's control lines that you're working along, um, roadways, et cetera, to, to work that perimeter, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, very useful. Thanks, David. Saw the question flagged here from Chief Baker as well. So someone was asking that there, an agency is currently using the M300 RTK with the H20T. And the goal being to map an area with the thermal camera and then uh, add, add the hotspots with the H20T to share with the team for reporting purposes. So you can confirm that you can overlay the 2D thermal map on both the remote controller and the Flight Hub 2, and then the pins will be overlaid directly over them. So that is a overall feature that is available. Question in regards to dual controller for the Mavic 2 Enterprise Advanced. Unfortunately, that currently is not a planned development for that platform. We don't currently have pricing info in regards to Flight Hub 2. It's currently free and available in public beta, but do want to make sure that is an affordable solution for public safety agencies. So we're continuing uh, to discuss that with end users in regards to uh, what makes sense there. And then one, uh, one more chief kind of expanding on what you said earlier. Um, would you say beyond having the 107, is the FEMA ICS also needed uh, to work with your local fire and EMS? Yes, it, it, it is going to be, um, it, it's required of all firefighters uh, across the, the nation. Um, so one of the things we did was our civilian support staff, we, we went ahead and made them go through it as, as well. Um, it is also a grant requirement, I believe, for uh, uh, those that are looking at FEMA grants uh, that your personnel have, uh, those as the basic. Um, there are others that if you're able to go to um, are uh, good as well. Um, they, they are uh, sometimes, uh, with, with my ADHD sitting in a classroom, is 
really difficult. So taking a week long uh, class such as ICS 300 and 400, which is helping you learn how to manage those incidents. And while you might not manage the incident itself, uh, it would be good to have those because now you are talking about uh, managing a team on an incident. You have a better perspective of what's going on from the incident uh, management uh, level. Um, and, um, you know, you can progress on to there to uh, they have uh, aviation specific um, classes that you can take. And, um, you know, pretty much these are free free courses in the United States, but um, depending on how you're um, getting to go, you may be paying your own way to get to where the course is offered, um, lodging, things like that. But sometimes uh, if you do get on an incident management team, uh, your state will probably be covering those charges um, for you. And I'd be interested to know, do you guys have something similar, David? in New Zealand? Yeah, that's that's correct. So um, our, all our UAV or UAS uh, operations um, typically operate as a, a three-man crew. Um, so you actually have a, a wildfire crew leader uh, managing communications uh, externally to the crew, um, managing uh, what we call laces, uh, lookouts, awareness, communication, uh, safety and escape routes and so on um, and has that formal qualifications and training at that crew leader uh, status uh, and then of course you've got your your sensor operator and your pilot um, without doubt uh, obviously needing those uh, particular licenses to operate at night uh, and so on as well as um, being trained uh, with the lower level uh, qualifications for uh, operating on a on a wildfire awareness etc um, and and working together to to manage the the information in the craft uh, while flying yeah that's another good point there there are uh, wildland firefighter safety classes that I would recommend um, in addition to other safety classes uh, in the US that uh, you can take um, yeah, just to make your operations safer. Even though you're more than likely are not gonna be on a fire line, uh, you'll be back uh, in the uh, safe zones. Um, it's still good for you to have because from the air, you can start to learn and identify uh, areas of hazard or David mentioned, escape routes and safety zones for crews. Awesome. Well, I think that wraps things up on the questions. The recording will be sent out a few hours here after, along with additional resources later this week. You'll also receive a survey after the webinar here, so it would really be great if you all could fill that out. We're excited to hear your feedback and continue to improve these in the future. Um, Dave, Wayne, any uh, final words before we uh, bid our goodbyes here? Yeah, just quickly, Grant, uh, thank you very much for, for hosting the webinar. Uh, been excellent to be able to share a little bit of what we're doing down here in the Southern Hemisphere and, uh, and certainly looking really forward to uh, continuing to work with DJI and uh, in the capabilities of, of the Flight Hub 2 and, and DJI Pilot 4. And then I want to definitely thank you, David, for getting up. Uh... <laughs> in the middle of the night to be a part of this really appreciate that and um i've also put my uh, email address down in the chat wayne.baker at dji.com i know we had some questions we weren't quite able to get to uh and hopefully i can help you through that awesome thanks all appreciate you spending some time with us